Hello all, welcome to the uh, training video for uh, designing manual test cases. Here we are going to have a look at few of the black box test design techniques. Uh, given that test designing is a very complex process, we need to follow a structured uh, way of writing test cases and picking up the test data out of large number of test data to which application may have to be tested. So let's let's begin with it and let's see our first black box test design technique, which is known as equivalence class partitioning. Equivalence class partitioning is a method which is used uh, to cut down the number of test data to which we have to test application with. For example, if we have to test application with the uh, lakhs of numbers, we cannot keep keying in one, two, three till lakh to test the application how it behaves. And this is where equivalence class partitioning comes into the picture. In equivalence class partitioning, we take the test data and we try to divide it in a smaller number of partitions. And these partitions are called equivalence class partitions. These partitions are called equivalence because if you pick up any of the data out of these partition, then it is going to reveal the same defect if we had picked up any other data set from the partition. So this way we can cut down the large number of data sets into the smaller number and the manageable data set. This is the biggest example of using equivalence class partitioning. So let us see one example of equivalence class partitioning here. Consider that we have an application which takes numbers from 1 to 12, which are the month. So we know that the least possible value could be 1 and the max possible value could be 12. Now anything which is less than 1 or anything which is greater than 12 is not a valid number. So in this case, we have three partitions here. We have one invalid partition which is value less than 1. We have valid partition, which is values between 1 and 12. And we have, again, an invalid partition, which is values greater than 12. So if we go by the definition of equivalence class partitioning, we can pick up just one value out of all of these partitions. So I can pick up one value from invalid partition. Say, for example, minus 1 I can take. And one value from the valid partition, I can pick up 6 here, which is a valid value for the month. And then one value from the another invalid partition, so I can take 14, because 14 is not a possible value for month. So this is how we have divided values 1 to 12 to just 3 values with which we can test the system. And now equivalence class partitioning is regarded as black box test design technique because we really do not know how system internally functions. We have these numbers and on the basis of on the basis of a specification or on the basis of the knowledge we have, we come up with these partitions. But consider if we had knowledge of internal functioning of system. Consider that we had known how system processes the data. In the same example, if we knew that system performs evaluation in a certain way for number between 1 to 6 and number between 7 to 12, in that case, we would have two valid partitions. Our earlier valid partition was limited between 1 and 12, but now the new valid partition would have two set of uh, classes. It would be 1 to 6 and 7 to 12. So in this case, we would pick up one value between 1 and 6 and another valid value between 7 and 12. The invalid partition partitions remain same. The objective here is to know that equivalence class partitioning is largely applied when we do not know the internal functioning of the system or the application under test. But if we know that, then the same technique could be applied as a gray box technique as well, which is a mixture of both black box as well as white box test design technique. So this is the first test design technique, which is equivalence class partitioning. Let's move on to the next test design technique, which is boundary value analysis. So let's see what's there in boundary value analysis. So boundary value analysis says that if you have derived your equivalence classes out of which you are going to pick up your test data, then you should pick up the test data on the boundaries because if your system performs well on the boundaries, then it may as well do good when value are well within the boundaries. So if I take the previous example wherein we had data for month between 1 and 12, 
and if I have to boundary value analyze it, then I can see that I have boundary at 0 and 1, wherein 0 is my first invalid boundary and 1 is my first valid boundary, as well as I have valid value 12, which is last valid value, and after 12, 13, which is my first invalid value. So when I'm designing data, or I'm picking up the test data, I should incorporate these values at the boundaries. So my test data in this case could be 0 and 1 as well as 12 and 13. Hence, data is chosen on the boundaries. Now, if we see this in a more general case, this is just with the numbers. But if your application has certain attributes, say for example, it has characters, it has position, it has quantity, it has a speed, it has location or size, then think of the boundaries associated with all of these conditions. So think of what could be the first value, what could be the last value, what is start, what is finish, what if it is empty, what if it is full, what if it is slowest, what if it is fastest, what, it is, what if it is largest, what if it is smallest, what is max, what is min, what is highest, what is lowest. So come up with boundaries associated with all the attributes which are their part of application and which affect the output of the application. This becomes a boundary value analysis. Pick up the data, pick up your equivalence classes. After deriving equivalence classes, know the boundaries of those equivalence classes and pick up data on those boundaries. That's about it. Okay, next comes the decision table testing. Okay, this decision table testing seems to be a little complicated, but it is not. We'll see in a while. The decision table testing is used when we want to execute tests on multiple input conditions. Okay, so we have multiple inputs and depending on the, uh, say for example, truthfulness of those conditions, different actions are carried out. So it is a it is a really good tool when it comes to combining different inputs and knowing the completeness of the system. So if you have a look at the chart here, I have certain conditions C1, C2, C3 on the left hand side and then there are certain rules and the values you see as T or F which are true or false which could be the value of the conditions and towards bottom I have certain actions A1, A2, A3 till A5 and these are the actions which are taken. So if you want to read this decision table it would go as conditions could be true or false and depending on that a certain action is taken. Say for example if conditions C1, C2, C3 all are true in that case action A1 and A2 and A5 are taken, action A3 and A5 are not taken. So depending on the truthfulness of different conditions, certain actions are taken. Say for example, I see rule number 7, which is R7. Here condition C1 is false, C2 is false, and C3 is true. In that case, only action A4 is taken, no other action is taken. So we need to know the rules which could be applied on different conditions and on the basis of that different actions could be taken. Now here the thing to notice is these rules may not necessarily be just binary. They may not be just true or false and if that is not the case then your set of combination is going to be huge. Okay. Now one more thing to notice here is that uh, depending on the uh, interpretation of input your actions vary. We had a look at the uh, example there. So let's see a real world example for this. Uh, here, yeah. so if you have done online shopping, you would see that certain items are available for cash on delivery and certain items are not available for cash on delivery. So let's consider our conditions as whether item allows COD or not. COD is abbreviation for cash on delivery and assume that COD is allowed only when item cost is less than 5000. Assume that COD is allowed only when COD is available from ship uh, for ship from address which is your seller's address and consider that COD is allowed when it is available or 
available for ship to address okay so this is for your logistic partner for example if you're using blue dart or aramax or dtdc in that case these logistic partners or these services should be capable of doing cod for both ship from which is your seller to ship to which is which is your which is your house and collect the cash so we see that COD is possible only when all of these conditions are satisfied. Okay, so let us see uh, two examples here. First example is where COD is not allowed. Well, if item does not have COD, in that case, it doesn't make any difference whether other conditions are true or not. COD will not be allowed. Consider third case here where item COD is allowed. Item cost is less than 5000, but the uh, the, the, the logistic partner does not have COD operation for ship from or ship to address. In that case, COD is not allowed. So in this table, only the last use case is wherein we have COD available for all the conditions. So COD for the last use case is COD is allowed. Item cost is less than 5000. Ship from address COD is allowed. Ship to address COD is allowed. Hand COD is allowed overall. So this is a real world example of decision table and as i said the conditions do not necessarily have to be just true or false and if not so then your decision table may become quite complex okay let's move on to next test design technique which is a state transition testing a state transition testing okay if you if you uh, if you are from electronics or computer or it background you may have read about the finite automata theory. Finite automata theory states about what different states a machine can go through. Even if you are not from those backgrounds, it should be easy to understand that when you have a system, the system can undergo certain, certain states. And these states decide all the possible flows in an application. Okay, so here we have input and depending on the input, the system may reach from one state to another. This kind of testing, this kind of test case derivation could be best explained using an example. The example which I have considered here is withdrawing money from ATM. And then let's see what are conditions it may undergo when we try to withdraw, mach and withdraw money from an ATM. So we begin with this and we insert our card. And as soon as we insert the card, we are asked for PIN number. Now when we are asked for PIN number, we can <coughs> we may either enter right PIN number or we may not know the PIN number, we may forget it. So we may enter the wrong PIN number. If we enter the right PIN number, then we would have access to the account. Otherwise, we are allowed few number of trials. Given that it's a financial transaction, ATM cannot accept large number of invalid PIN numbers. So it would allow you to enter wrong PIN number only for certain times. So if you enter wrong PIN number first, it may allow you twice. If you enter PIN right, you have access to account. If not, then you are allowed again. If you enter right PIN number, you have access to account. If it is not okay, then ATM is not going to return your card or ATM machine may block your card considering that it's not you, it's someone else impersonating you or trying to take advantage of your card and do fraudulent transaction. So this is one example of a state transition testing. Think of these different states when you're writing test for an application and come up with different test data. Imagine these situations which your application may undergo and try to see through that you have covered all of those conditions, all of those test data in your manual test cases. So this is about state transition testing. There is one more technique which you may hear of, which is called error guessing. I have not really written an example of it, but it is largely derived on the basis of your experience with the application or the domain knowledge you may have. So you, if you have worked, say for example, on a financial application, you may know that certain kind of errors may occur with the decimal point calculation. And then you may look for such sort of errors in any other financial application you work with. So on the basis you will, on the basis of your experience, on the basis of your uh, certain assumptions, you may find defects, which is called error guessing. So these all were the test case design technique. Uh, I must mention that these are the black box test design techniques. We have not yet seen the white box test design techniques. We would see them in the next session. 
uh, here that's about it for uh, this video if you like this video please click the like button and share it in your social circle thanks